Sean Casaberry, and this is another one of my philosophical lecture shorts. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about St. Anselm and the ontological argument. But in order to do that and talk about this great middle-aged philosopher, we need to go back a little bit farther and talk about uh, one of the kind of the first middle-aged, last ancient philosophers, as we like to think in the West, St. Augustine. Um, St. Augustine's an it, or St. Augustine, as some of you may have heard about it, okay? Um, heard his name called. Uh, we can't get all into everything about St. Augustine, but there's a couple things we need to know to understand where St. Anselm's coming from, because we'll see St. Augustine has definitely influenced St. Anselm. Um, one of the big things that you might kind of first be surprised about is we're about to talk about a proof for the existence of God. A lot of people today think that maybe reasoning or philosophy and religion and God are things that are not compatible with each other, that they're kind of antithesis of each other. And that may be true today where people think that oh, faith in God is the only way to know God. But back uh, in the Middle Ages, and even in the modern period of philosophy as well, people thought that reasoning, philosophy, could actually help us understand who God was and perhaps even prove him. Some, like St. Augustine, even said that reason and scripture, or God, are one. In the sense that God has given us reason to know that God exists and to know what he wants. It's like a divine gift by God given to us in order to use to know God exists. Now, this wasn't his original idea. Aristotle said something very similar, but St. Augustine Gives, up to, gives it to us in the Christian sense for the first time, and it would really prepare this idea for what we would now know as Western philosophy, okay? Um, so that's the first thing. Reason and scripture are one. You can show that God exists as a belief, and Anselm will buy into this as well. Um, another big idea we're going to need to know before we talk about Anselm is St. Augustine's idea of the great chain of being. Now, what he suggested, this is a, this is a theory of imminence about God. And think about what it means to emanate. Uh, and if I draw maybe a candle here is how it's always explained. You have a candle here with flame, there you go, and light emanates from it. And eventually, as it emanates away, it gets darker and darker and darker. Now, according to the great chain of being, God is the center of this flame. And all other beings in existence emanate from God. So they're part of God, but emanate out of him. And as the closer you are to God, the more perfect you are, like God is perfect. Okay? The further you are away from God, the less perfect you are until there's nothingness. And though this little little chain here could go on further, okay? This is kind of what St. Anselm or St. Augustine was thinking about. You have God up here, and then you have the angels, which are closest, emanating from him, but a little less perfect, but more perfect than humans, okay? But humans are right under angels, and then you have the higher animals, the lower animals, the plants, higher plants, lower plants, you know, we could even consider dirt and bacteria and all those things, and eventually it gets to where there's nothingness. The closer you are to God, the more perfect you are. Okay? And so we see humans are definitely higher than, or better than the higher animals according to this, lower animals, more perfect because they are more like God. This is an idea that we'll see will permeate the Middle Age philosophy. St. Augustine uh, believed it, excuse me, St. Anselm, we'll even see St. Thomas Aquinas, a lot of these ideas St. Thomas Aquinas even takes on. Um, now, before we go on, one thing I'd like to mention, this idea a lot of times is critiqued quite a bit, though we're just going to mention it and accept it and move on, um, just for the sake of the argument, but a lot of people... Uh, if we look back at this, this part right here, a lot of people see this as a way in which you could possibly dis discriminate or perhaps judge other people who are different from you. And we'd like to point out that many of the people who take this idea of human beings, okay, many of the people who believe in this believe that most people we would consider human beings probably aren't human beings, okay, or at least not perfect or in the sense of how you're supposed to be human. Um, anyone who wasn't a Christian in this idea would definitely probably be closer to a higher animal than a human being. Anyone maybe of a different ethnicity, things like this. And this is what worries a lot of people. When you think of things in this way, is it a way in which you can now judge and put people below you? Okay? Now, we're not going to get into that, but that's something we should keep in mind with this idea. Okay? But now let's move on to St. Anselm. We're jumping about 500 years. Okay? Um, the Middle Ages were, or the beginning of the Middle Ages, were definitely a period of uh, a lot of war and torment. Okay? And, and, and not torment, excuse me. Well, there's torment there too, right? Okay, but a lot of uh, a lot of warring going on about which religion and which kind of you know territories were going to come dominant in Europe. By the time we get to about a thousand A.D., okay, we start to see you know Europe start becoming what we kind of see it as today. You know, Christianity has kind of become the dominant force. Things begin relaxing a little bit more, and we see the return of Greek philosophy to God. Okay, and of course Saint Augustine is one, or Saint Augustine is one of the people that is brought in on this as well. And Saint Anselm takes Christianity like St. Augustine did, and he sees Plato, and he sees Aristotle, and he begins mixing their ideas with this idea, okay, with the idea of God, and he thinks that he can prove him. And so he tries to, and what we know from St. Anselm, one of his most famous arguments is what we call the ontological argument. 
Now, one thing we gotta um, we gotta remind ourselves uh, of is the distinction between what we call a priori. Let's put it here, a priori, and a posteriori thinking. Okay. Now, we've talked about this before in other other lectures, but a priori thinking is basically uh, anything you can know. Okay, that you can know just by thinking about it. That you do not need experience to know it. For example, two plus two equals four, or that an object cannot be all black and all white at the same time. We don't need to experience those things to know it. We can just think and know it. Okay? Um, then there's a posteriori thinking, which is this type of thinking gives knowledge that we must have experience for. Like how tall is the Empire State Building? Or is the sky, what color is the sky? You couldn't know these things just by thinking about them. You have to experience it. Now the reason I want to bring these ideas up right here is because, much like Plato, St. Anselm is very critical of a posteriori thinking. He takes the word of experience and the word of senses as being corrupt, okay? And if we start with an argument that begins in the word of experience, the corrupt world, you will, and try to prove God with that, you will end up with a corrupt idea of God. And God is perfect. He's not corrupt, remember, okay? So what he decides to do is says you can't prove him this way, and he suggests we prove him a priori, okay? We prove God just by thinking about him. And so what Anselm is saying is that just by thinking, we can come to know that God exists, and must necessarily exist. Quite a tall uh, task right here, but we'll see what he says. Now, to begin this argument, once we have this down here, okay, let's erase this distinction right here, okay? Once we have this idea down, we let's start with what he wants to say. And basically, he opens with this. He says, God exists so truly that you can't even think that he doesn't exist. So what he's saying is, even if I think and go, he doesn't exist, and begin thinking this, what he's saying is basically, I end up in a contradiction. Just as if I was saying 2 plus 2 equals 10, okay, which is impossible, all right? He's saying, if I say there is no God, it's just like saying 2 plus 2 equals 10. It's just as illogical and contradictory as that. We have to see what he means, because it seems right now I'm thinking that I could think God doesn't exist. So what is he talking about? Now, to go any further, we need to talk about his definition of God, okay? It's a little different than the PKG God, which we'll come very familiar with, with St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? The all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. Though it's the same God, he doesn't define him like that. And this is why we had the great chain of being earlier, because he defines God as that which no greater being can be conceived. He is the greatest possible being. Now, if we hadn't have had this little idea about the great chain of being, this may sound weird. But as we see, look at all St. Augustine. He's borrowing this idea. God is the greatest possible being. He is that which no greater being can be conceived. If I can think of a greater being than God, then he's not God. God is the greatest possible being. You, if there's a way to conceive of something better, then what you're thinking about isn't God. God is better than that. Okay? He is the greatest possible being. And this makes sense, first in the reference to St. Augustine, but also it makes sense if you think about if there was a being out there that was worthy of my worship, it seems the one that was worthy of worship would be the greatest possible being, right? And another thing and the reason he wants to kind of keep in these more obscure terms, though we can think about the greatest possible being, it's really hard to imagine or conceive, we should say, about what that being would look like. It seems possible we could think of it, but how does that being look? It seems difficult. And kind of having this negative understanding of God is good, because if we could think of God perfectly, we would have to be God, and God wouldn't be all-powerful, and it would be the same, and he would kind of be a, uh, a, a kind of a, a um, restriction on his power. So it's good that we can't think of him perfectly, because if we could, like I said, we would be God. All right? So this makes sense, at least in this context. So once we have this down, Let's begin the argument. And quoting from Psalm 14.1, okay, he talks about the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Okay, so the fool, of course, is the atheist here who says there is no God. Now, St. Anselm kind of begins like this. He says, well, there's two things that are going on here for the fool, okay? The fool has either, one, doesn't understand language and doesn't understand grammar, okay? And therefore, once I explain to him how language works and what grammar is, he will quickly understand by saying God does not exist, he's in contradiction. So all I have to do is give him a le lesson in language, and he'll be fine. That's the first thing. And of course, we kind of take San Anselm as being a little sarcastic there, right? The second possibility, though, okay, of the fool, he says, or the fool understands language completely, knows the words that are coming out of my mouth, and still, the utter, and still decides to utter contradictions over and over again. So understands what God means, understands what a contradiction is, on and on and on, understands what the greatest possible being is, and still says no. The argument, of course, the ontological argument, is geared towards that, okay, that person. So the fool who claims God does not exist 
let's see what Anselm would say to him. And so this is how it would work. Anselm would talk to the fool and say, all right, fool, okay? And this is how he puts it. Can you at least conceive of the greatest possible being? And of course, over here, the fool would have to go, well, Anselm, I can conceive of it. I can think of it in my mind. But of course, God doesn't really exist. Okay? He doesn't exist out here. But he does, yes, Anselm, I can conceive of what God would maybe be like or that greatest possible being. I could do that. Okay? But he doesn't really exist outside my mind. Okay? Over here. And so says, well, okay. So I want to ask you this, though. Is there an even greater possible being that you can conceive of? One that would be greater than one that exists in your mind and not necessarily outside. Okay? Is there a greater one than that? And, of course, the fool would go, no, I can't. I can only conceive of one in my mind. Okay? But Anselm goes once again, he goes, but think about it. Isn't there a greater being than, a greater possible being than the greatest being that exists in your mind and not outside in existence? Okay? Isn't there a greater being than that? And of course, this is where Anselm gets a trick. Of course there is. A greater being than one that exists in my mind, but not outside in reality. A greater being that would be one that not only exists in my mind, but also exists in reality. That's the greatest possible being. And once Anselm shows the fool that, he goes, thus God exists. The greatest possible being would not only exist in your mind, would have to exist out in reality. And that's the argument. Now, we're kind of going, wait a minute, what just happened there? Okay? Some of us may be utterly confused. Some of us may think Anselm's tricking us. Some just think that this is obvious their problem is, is right out in front of you. But let's see what happens. Let's go to the argument and break it down, and then we'll talk about it. Okay? So, this is the first. God is by definition the greatest possible being, that which no greater being can be conceived. Okay? A being which, uh, which, I should put it there, sorry guys, which fails to exist, okay, no, that's actually, I have that right, that's in this up, guys, sorry, a being which exists, okay, in the mind, while failing to exist in actuality, is less perfect than a being who exists in both, thus God exists, so this right here is the fool going, I can think of one in my mind, but one doesn't exist in reality, well, if we're talking about the greatest possible being, that wouldn't be the greatest possible being, the greatest possible being would have to be one that exists in my mind and in reality. Thus, God exists if he is the greatest possible being. Okay? That is the argument. Now, something seems strange here. And some of us may be reminded of our lectures on Descartes when he had the conceivability argument, a problem that he had there. But what is going on here? Why does God seem to exist? And uh, it exists because of it. This seems strange. Um, and a lot of people had these questions. Another famous uh, Italian philosopher, Danilo, Okay, who was a contemporary of Saint uh, Anselm, um, had the same problem. Okay, with this, and he says that this type of argument, if it were true, this is kind of a reductio ad absurdum. If it were true, then it would prove the perfect existence of anything. And so, what did he mean by that? And he comes up with this idea of what we call the perfect island. Now, just follow me here. There are no perfect islands in the world, but take take this take me for a second. So he says, I came up with this idea, Saint Anselm, called the perfect island. This island is the greatest possible island, or is the, is the great, excuse me, this island is the greatest possible island, okay? That which no greater island can be conceived. It is the perfect island, okay? And so he says, let's take perfect island and place it everywhere we see God in there, and then wherever we see being, we place island with it and see what happens. And so we do. So we say, the perfect island is by definition the greatest possible island. An island which fail, or which exists in the mind, while failing to exist in actuality, is less perfect than an island which exists in both. Thus, the perfect island exists. So he says, if this argument were true, then you would be able to prove perfect islands. Also, you could prove perfect goblins and perfect spaghetti monsters. Basically, Ganel says this argument, if it was true, would prove the perfect existence of everything. Therefore, Ganello wants to claim there's something wrong with the argument. Now, Ganello might not have the language yet, but he's right. He's on to something. Something is going on here. So what is it? And the main problem that he seems to get at is that just because you can, con and it seems obvious once I say this, but just because you can conceive of something doesn't mean that it necessarily exists, okay? And what we have here is the conceivability problem, all right? Conceivability, all right, ability does not equal necessary existence, okay? Just because, and it seems obvious, just because you can think it doesn't mean it's like that. I can conceive of anything I want. I can conceive of pur a purple, uh, half purple, half pink elephant that's invisible in the middle of the room, okay? It doesn't mean it's really there. But I can also conceive of a chair, which is right here, which is in the room. So sometimes you can conceive of things that are true, sometimes you don't. But just because you can think it doesn't mean it is the case, okay? And that's what's going on here. This is one of the biggest problems in middle-age philosophy, okay? Or biggest kind of fallacies that would go on. 
They try to get away with this idea all the time. Why a lot of people consider Descartes still a middle-aged philosopher because he uses this distinction a lot and he can't get away with it, okay? Um, so that is basically what's happening here. And, and what we see here, okay, is that because it's an a priori argument, and that's what we want to point out here, is because he keeps an a priori and doesn't bring it to, what was here earlier, the word experience, we can't know if it actually exists. What we want to talk about is real existence, but because he keeps it a priori, a priori just deals with concepts. It's basically this idea. This is what would happen if it did exist. Now, does it exist? A priori thinking can't say that. That has to do with a posteriori thinking. Two plus two may equal four, but it doesn't mean there's two things and two things out there that equal four. Okay? All this argument says is this. If God were to exist, then he must exist. Okay? That's which is pretty obvious, right? It's kind of a tautology there. I'll put it this way. If God were to exist, then he must exist perfectly. Necessary existence would be part of him if he were to exist. But that's a big if. We can't know that. We are just dealing, this is what the concept of God would be like, but it doesn't say that it actually exists. We can think of anything we want. Okay, now, what Anselm kind of gives his response to this, he responds to Ganello, he basically has a really famous answer, okay, a really famous reply. And he basically says, Ganello, I'm not talking about perfect islands or perfect whatever, I'm talking about God, okay? And God is much different than any other thing like this. You're using these objects. God is far greater than this, and you're actually in some way, you're disgracing his name by even putting this argument out there. Okay? A very famous kind of reply that we kind of get on Anselm for because we kind of see Ganello's point, even though he may not have been able to put it into these exact words. But why are we talking about Anselm, and why is this an important argument? Well, first of all, the ontological argument, in many different ways, lasts all the way until, I mean, the last really major one we see is with Immanuel Kant, who we're looking at the beginning of the 19th century. So this argument is a powerful one, and there are many different other versions that make it stronger, okay? But a lot of those deal with metaphysical and epistemological issues with the mind and the body, and thinking how we think of a mind, um, especially you'll see that with Kant. Um, but so it was a very influential argument, and, they, and many of these ideas cross over to other ideas not necessarily with God. So that's one reason. But another reason we want to put it is because it will set us up perfectly to see where St. Thomas Aquinas comes from. Because a lot of his, uh, his ideas will deal with a posteriori proofs of God. Which the reason he's doing that because he has seen the problem with doing it this way. He has seen what Anselm's done, and he wants to take those problems, fix them, and then make a better argument. And we'll see... I think St. Thomas Aquinas gives us a much better argument. So this argument is a very famous one, very influential, but as we see, it might not be the most convincing. But it will, it's a piece we need for everything else we'll discuss. But if you have any questions on that, please email me. Um, I'll see you next time uh, when we talk about Thomas Aquinas. Thank you.